I think I'd have to argue uh, too hard to convince you that we are broken people living in a broken world. There's chaos in the world all around us. You know, just in conversation this morning, I can't tell you how many uh, people I've heard from this morning that are really distraught about what is going on in our world today. There's so much confusion and chaos. What's What's right is being called wrong, and what's wrong is being called right. Sin is being celebrated. But there's also chaos and turmoil within our own souls. We're simultaneously sinners and sufferers. How are we as followers of Christ to respond when the world feels like it's crashing down and God seems like he's somewhere else doing something else and has completely forgotten about, about us, about you. Uh, Marina Noyes, a uh, pastor's wife in Ukraine, explained how her family deals with the hardships when, that have fallen on them uh, as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. She, she says, when the trouble comes, we cry. When it gets bad, we pray. And when it becomes unbearable, we sing. When the trouble comes, we cry. When it gets bad, we pray. And when it becomes unbearable, we sing. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 13 this morning. It's the Psalm of David. Psalm 13. It's very short. Um, It's just six verses. But it presents to us a big transformation in the psalmist's mood from the beginning to the end. The psalmist goes from sighing To singing, from despairing to delighting, from sorrowing to rejoicing. Spurgeon preached a, a sermon on this long, long time ago that was entitled From Howling to Singing. The title of my sermon today might be a little cheeky, but it's the life cycle of a Christian panic attack. Or Toby Baxley's sermon preparation process. <laughs> Scott asked me, uh, so how how you feeling about your sermon today? I'm like, well, I, I was up here yesterday feeling pretty good about it. And the day before, feeling pretty good about it. I woke up this morning thinking, oh, this is gonna be terrible. <laughs> He's, he said, sounds about right. <laughs> So uh, let's, let's read this text today and uh, jump right in. I'm reading from the Legacy Standard Bible this morning, uh, recently published. Uh, and it says, How long, O Yahweh, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul? having sorrow in my heart all the day. How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Look and answer me, O Yahweh my God. Give light to my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy, says, I have overcome him, and my adversaries rejoice that I am shaken. But I have trusted in your loving kindness, My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to Yahweh because he has dealt bountifully with me. This is God's word. The outline of this psalm is in three neat and tidy sections. It's the lament, the request, and the thanksgiving. And I can't help but wonder if the Apostle Paul had this psalm in mind when he wrote to the church in Philippi. This is chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 of Philippians, when he wrote, Be anxious for nothing, 
but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There is a caveat here, a qualifier though that we need to make clear at the outset and it's in Christ Jesus. The peace of God that surpasses comprehension, that's inexplicable, is in Christ Jesus. This is a promise for those who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, who are united to him by faith. If you're here today and you're not a believer in Jesus, you may receive a temporary reprieve. God may help you in the short term, but it is not true and lasting peace. To know Jesus is to know peace, as we'll see later in the passage. So the sermon, the text idea today, central text idea is this. The psalmist, David, begins a prayer with deep anguish of soul and ends with joyous singing. And my sermon objective today is to give believers a blueprint to turn panic into praise. The sermon has three main emphases, three observations that I hope to point out from the text, and we'll put them all up on the screen and then back up. Uh, It's number one, panic is not sin. Number two, petition is not proud. And number three, praise is not silent. I'm using the term panic this morning very carefully. Uh, What I'm really talking about is anguish or lament, Uh, but for alliterative purposes, panic just worked best. So bear with me and understand, let the hearer understand uh, this morning. So let's begin with observation number one, or main emphasis number one, and that's panic is not sin. The psalm begins with a fourfold repetition of the phrase, how long? This represents deep anguish, darkness, and agony of the soul. How long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Forever? How long must I take counsel in my soul? Forever? How long will my enemy be exalted? Forever? But many of us would look at David and say, what's wrong with you? Are you even a believer? Trust God. Cheer up. Maybe maybe you've received this advice. Maybe you've given this counsel. But David was a man after God's own heart. And he dealt with anxiety and anguish of soul. What makes you think that you're going to be any different? There's something very frightening about feeling abandoned. It's one thing to be abandoned by family and friends, but there's another thing altogether about feeling abandoned by God himself. It feels like there's a chasm of separation between him and God. Now keep in mind that this is not a chasm of separation that is caused by sin, not his sin. Remember, broken people, broken world. We're sinners and sufferers. But if you're here today and you're not a believer in Christ, there is a real chasm that only the cross of Christ can bridge. But we don't see the chasm caused by sin in this passage as we would uh, from, say, Psalm 51, where David wrote, "'Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness.'" According to the abundance of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you. You only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and pure when you judge. There's no indication in this psalm that this is a sin issue on David's part. Most likely from verses two and four, David feels the abandonment of family and friends. There are two big events that uh, in in church history and in 
Old Testament history uh, to which he could be referring. Uh, he was on the run from Saul, the, the king, uh, who's trying to kill him. Uh, and, uh, and Saul was also the father of David's best friend, Jonathan. So that might cause you a bit of anxiety, a bit of panic, right? And uh, he was also, uh, later, he was on the defensive from his own son, Absalom, who sought to undermine David's kingdom and establish himself as the king. So David feels that somehow God has abandoned him. And we can fall into this trap as well if we're not spiritually careful, right? When things are good, we think, God must be pleased with me. When things are bad, when we lose a job, when we have trouble finding work, when we're in poor health, when we experience the death of a loved one, a devastating cancer diagnosis, overwhelming car problems, we can errantly assume that God is displeased with us and somehow is punishing us. But, beloved, don't assume that God's presence or pleasure is mediated by your performance. Our relationship with God is not a meritocracy. It's not a transactional relationship. I do good, I get good. I do bad, I get, I get bad. If our relationship with God is a meritocracy, then it's based on the merit of Christ. If you are in Christ, God's pleasure with you is not based on your performance, but on Christ's performance, his obedience, his goodness, his faithfulness to the law, his sacrificial death, his glorious resurrection and exaltation that we spoke about this morning. That's grace, God's reward at Christ's expense. Grace is a person, and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. So are you resting? Are you resting in the work of Christ on your behalf? Or are you turned inward, looking at your own performance to see if God is pleased with you? I want you to notice something else here. This fourfold lament is an escalation of emotion, but it is not anger. Back to my original point, Panic is not sin. Lament is not sin. David's lament was anguish, not anger. Back in July, I just happen to have a copy of that here. Back in July, we had a small book about a big problem as our book of the month. We could not keep them in stock. And that says to me that we have an anger problem. This book made a huge impact on me. And from what I've heard from several of you, it's made a big impact on, on you as well. You and I have an anger problem, whether we choose to recognize it or not. And it was suggested to me by my sweet wife that perhaps anger is misplaced lament. Perhaps anger is misplaced lament. We would rather turn inward and brood about it and stew rather than express our anguish to the one of whom the Bible says sticks closer than a brother, who is born for adversity, the one who is our ever-present help in time of need. Being anguished of soul is not sin. We're broken people living in a broken world. We're sinners and sufferers. Being anguished of soul is a natural response to living in a broken and chaotic world. You should, be, you should look at what's going on in the world around and be broken and be in anguish. This is not the way it's supposed to be, right? Now, it can lead to sin if we don't direct our anguish in the right direction. That brings us to our second observation this morning, and it's this, petition is not proud. Look at verses three and four again. 
Look and answer me, O Yahweh, my God. Give light to my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemy says I have overcome him. My adversaries rejoice that I am shaken. So now we see David look upward. He had been looking outward and it had turned him inward. But now, instead of listening to his heart and wallowing in panic, he turns upward and petitions God. Consider and answer me. The NASB says, consider and answer me. The legacy standard says, look and answer me. Other translations say, look at me and answer. This is in direct contrast to his uh, asking God, how long are you going to forget me? See, in the Bible, forgetting is forsaking. And David was feeling as if God had forsaken him and was pleading with God to remember him. Also, David pleads with God to enlighten his eyes. Have you ever seen someone who is so downcast and sorrowful that they just walk around, you know, hunched over, eyes down on the, on the floor? Their eyes literally do not reflect any light because there's no light on the floor to, to reflect, right? It's once they look up that their eyes have catch lights in them. David is bowed down with care and pleads with God to lift his head, to lift his eyes. You know, David is pleading the Aaronic blessing from number six. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his face on you and give you peace. So when David's praying, enlighten my eyes, he says, turn to me, lift your face upon me that I may have light in my eyes. But at this point, David may feel like he's receiving like the reverse of the ironic blessing, right? He's like, he's experiencing the ironic curse. Everything that he's experiencing feels like the, the blessing in reverse. And his enemies, perhaps Saul, perhaps Absalom, may have occasion to rejoice in his demise. Perhaps you have adversaries who would love to see you fall and give up in your Christian walk. It's very tempting to do, and many choose that path. When trouble comes, they run from God instead of running to God. So maybe it's a coworker, unbelieving family member who are keeping their eye on you to see if this Christian thing is all that you say it is. Just this past week, <coughs> a well-known, fairly well-known Christian leader was forced to take a leave of absence after it was discovered that he had been carrying on an inappropriate relationship with a woman via Instagram messenger. And it didn't take very long for the keyboard warriors to come out in full force to spew all sorts of opinions about not only him, but all Christian leaders and Christians in general. It was, it's like those critical of David that he writes about in Psalm 35 when he says, aha, aha, we saw it. We knew it was going to happen. It was just a matter of time. This brother claims that the relationship between him and this woman was not sexual, but was familiar and frequent, too familiar and too frequent. And in his statement to his church, he said that the situation had revealed darkness and unhealth in his soul. I don't know if we'll ever actually know what happened, nor do we need to know. But I can speculate that what it revealed was a certain level of thinking that he had everything under control. His life, his ministry, this particular relationship, and God, in his sovereign mercy, essentially said, I'll have none of that. Look, David realized what a desperate situation he was in. Do we realize that? 
Do we realize that only in Christ do we live and move and breathe and have our being? Acts 17. So this prayer, look at me and answer, is forthright, but it is not arrogant. It acknowledges that only God is our shield and glory and the one who can lift our heads. Psalm 3.3. Arrogance is only evident in not coming to him. Arrogance is evident in trying to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Several years ago, I enjoyed watching a silly sitcom uh, called The George Lopez Show. I don't know if any of you remember that from the early 2000s. Uh, the, the Internet Movie Database describes the show as a Los Angeles manufacturing plant manager attempting to deal with his wacky family along with other random mishaps. It's kind of a generic description. But in this almost every show, when a situation would come up, his wife Angie would be getting a little anxious about it, and George would, I don't know if I can do this justice, he, he would throw up his hands and go, I got this, right? I got this. At the moment he said that, you knew for sure that he didn't got this, right? <laughs> Whatever the situation was, he didn't got this. This was the point where you knew that George was headed for some sort of comic disaster. The brothers and sisters, bootstrap Christianity is not biblical. Bootstrap Christianity is not the gospel. God does not help those who help themselves. God is the helper of the helpless. The problem is we don't realize, we don't recognize, we don't confess and admit how helpless we actually are. We pridefully think, I got this. And when we do, we're not headed for comic disaster, but cosmic disaster. Because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And what does this mean for you today? Number one, stop praying small prayers to a small God of your own design. God is bigger and more holy and majestic than you can ever imagine. Similar to number one, stop praying small prayers to an austere and distant and severe God of your own design. The God of the magnitude is also the God of the minutia. Pastor Chris likes to say that God is both infinite and imminent. He's infinitely large and infinitely near. And he invites you this is good news. He invites you through Christ Jesus to come boldly to the throne of grace. Look at me and answer me is a bold petition, but it is not proud. We should pray big, bold prayers to the God who is infinite and holy, but also rich in love and compassion. And it's only pride if you refuse to come. This brings us to our third point today, that praise is not silent. Let's read verses five and six again. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to Yahweh because he has dealt bountifully with me. What happened between verses one and five? Why has David literally changed his tune? You know, from the text, we don't really know. What we do know is that David's circumstances haven't changed. But here David uses possibly the most glorious conjunction in the whole Bible, but. I feel like you've forgotten me. I feel like you've turned your back. I've prayed for an answer. And perhaps this is God's answer when David looks up and says, but I have trusted in your loving kindness, your unfailing love. 
The Hebrew word for loving kindness or unfailing love is chesed. And it's God's covenant-keeping love, his enduring and active love. It's faithful love that follows you. It's faithful love that goes before you. It's faithful love that hems you in on all sides. David rejoices. He trusts in the chesed of God. He also rejoices in God's deliverance. Are his enemies still after him? Yes. Will he be delivered? Also yes. David is rejoicing in a deliverance he has not yet seen, but he knows is coming. In about A.D. 64, the Apostle Peter wrote to scattered exiles that they'd been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. He said this was cause for rejoicing, even though they were experiencing trials of various kinds so that the proof of their faith would result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. He also reminded them that they had been redeemed by precious blood of a lamb who was foreknown, he was chosen before the foundation of the world, but had appeared in these last times. God's promises are always yes and amen in Christ. And you can take every promise of God to the bank because it is as good as done. The word salvation in verse 5 is very interesting. The Hebrew word for your salvation in verse 5 is Yeshua. Sound familiar? It's the very same name that Joseph was instructed to give the son of his virgin bride. Matthew 1 The angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus, Yeshua, God's salvation, Yahweh saves. David essentially says here, by the Spirit of God, I have trusted in your chesed, and I rejoice in Yeshua. I rejoice in the Messiah I have not seen, yet I love and I know is coming. Peter also wrote, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but you believe in him and rejoice greatly with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. And in the midst of our panic, in the midst of our anguish of soul, we can also say by the Spirit, I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in Jesus Christ, the one who lived the perfect life I should have lived the one who died the horrible death that I deserved, the one who was raised and exalted to God's right hand, the one who lives to intercede for me, pleading his righteousness on my behalf, the one who is coming in power and glory. My heart rejoices in God's salvation. Blessed be his name. Amen. And upon this remembrance, the anguished psalmist bursts forth in glorious song. He breaks forth in singing because there are some truths that are too profound for mere words. Martin Luther said that beautiful music is the art of the prophets that can calm the agitations of the soul. So why do we sing? Colossians 3, 16 and 17. It says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Uh, Bob Coughlin 
writing for DesiringGod.org, said that we sing to remember God's word. Literally here it says to remember the gospel. We, we let the gospel dwell in us, among us, richly. Number two, to respond to God's grace. We do this with thankfulness. This is a wholehearted activity. And number three, to reflect God's glory. It expresses our unity with believers of every age. Our faith is a singing faith. It imitates our own singing trinity. Zephaniah 3.17 says that God rejoices over us with singing. And it anticipates our own glorification when we'll sing without sin and without sadness and without dementia and without aging and without time constraints. So what can you do in the meantime? Sing with all your heart every chance you get. Sing with your mind every chance you get. How? Firstly, incorporate singing into your personal devotional life. KBC curates two playlists, on one on YouTube and one on Spotify. Almost all the songs we sing here are on those lists. So you can pull those up anytime and follow along the songs that we sing. You can encourage your own heart throughout the week with the songs that we sing. Part of our, also, part of our new construction will be a, a bookstore of sorts just out there around the corner. It'll be shelves stocked with books that, we have, in, that have impacted us as a staff and we believe will encourage you. And I intend to have hymnals be a part of that bookstore. I also intend to have CDs available of our churches singing within about a year's time. And I have a feeling you're going to hold me accountable to that. <laughs> Secondly, if you're in a family, sing as a family. It's going to be awkward at first, but get over it. It'll get better. Or it'll seem less awkward because you're used to it, right? <laughs> Take those playlists and rehearse on your own for every Lord's Day service. And I have a feeling that my kids are going to hold me accountable for this. So why should you sing? Why did David sing? Because the Lord had dealt bountifully with him. Listen to these words from Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up. And have not let my enemies rejoice over me. O oh, Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you healed me. O oh, Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You have kept me alive that I would not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you godly ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor for a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. Psalm 33, sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Sing praises to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song, play skillfully with a shout of joy. Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. And finally, Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. And he has not dealt with us as our sins deserve, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. 
For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. God has dealt bountifully with us because the justice that our sins deserved was dealt to Jesus Christ. He was forsaken for your forgiveness. His head was bowed down on the cross so that yours could be lifted up. He was anguished of soul so you could rejoice in his salvation. Panic is not sin. Petition is not proud. And praise is not silent. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, blessed be your name in all the earth. We thank you that we have this example in scripture of a true believer who struggled with anxiety and anguish, but instead of turning inward and listening to his heart, he turned upward in praise and glory and worship and was able to counsel his own soul to bless the Lord. I thank you that you lifted his eyes and that you lift our eyes when we humble ourselves before you and admit that we need your help. We pray for the grace to do that very thing. In Jesus' name, amen.